in her talk, Life-Giving Water for You, inspired by John 4, verses 4 to 29, Joan Maple encourages us to ask God to transform our lives with the springs of living water that he has waiting for us. I'm up for it. Are you? Father God, we come to your word this morning. We pray that you will speak through your word, not through my words, but through your word, and bless your people. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't know if any of you have ever been to Israel. Anybody? Well, I went a few years ago. Brilliant trip it was. And as part of that trip, we uh, went by coach down through the desert to the Dead Sea. It was stark, dry country on either side of the road. But here and there were little plantations that were fresh and green and growing vegetables of different kinds. I seem to remember sweet corn was one of the things that they were growing. We got down to the Dead Sea and I have to say it was a bit of a disappointment. We did the things that everybody did. We changed into our um, swimming costumes and we went in the water and we sat in the water because it holds you up and we, we did what everybody else did and then we plodded out up the rocky incline to where the changing rooms were. The water was a bit kind of greasy, I felt, and the... The rocky shore was hard on the feet. We were told afterwards that the Dead Sea is shrinking. And that's why there was that long slope down to the water. It's shrinking because people are siphoning off water from the rivers that feed the Dead Sea which is full of the minerals and the salt that holds you up in the water, whether you can swim or not. And because the water was being siphoned off to irrigate all those little plantations we'd seen, then um, the sea was shrinking. Whether it still is, I don't know. That was about five, six years ago. I want us to look first this morning at Judges chapter 1. Um, in the normal Bible that you've got, it's page 242. And in the big Bible, it's 426. When God's people got to the promised land, it wasn't empty. There were people living there, there were cities there, and they had to fight every inch of the way. And as the land was liberated, it was parceled out to the different tribes to settle in and to hold and to use. After Joshua died, that's the, um, the book before this, Judges, that we're going to read from. After Joshua died, Caleb was in command. Remember, he was one of, the, one of the spies that went into the land, and he's now the commander. Let's, um, let's start with um, verse 9. Verse 9, I better put my glasses on. From verse 9. 
various battles have been going on. After that, the men of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites living in the hill country, the Negev, and the western foothills. They advanced against the Canaanites living in Hebron and defeated Sheshai, Ahiman, and Talmai. From there, they advanced against the people living in Debir. And Caleb said, I will give my daughter Aska in marriage to the man who attacks and captures Kiriath Sefer. Othniel, son of Kenes, Caleb's younger brother, took it. So Caleb gave his daughter Aksar to him in marriage. I wonder if she was consulted. We're not told. Let's hope she was. They were cousins, so they would have known each other. And um, Othniel obviously felt that she was worth fighting for. One day, when she came to Othniel, she urged him to ask her father for a field. When she got off her donkey, Caleb, her dad, asked her, what can I do for you? She replied, do me a special favor. Since you have given me, the, me land in the Negev, give me also springs of water. Then Caleb gave her the upper and lower springs. So, Othniel fought for his wife and she found herself married and sent to live in a dry, unproductive land. I see her as a woman of determination, don't you? She wasn't satisfied with the dryness. She asked her husband to ask for more land. And there's no record of whether he did what she asked. Maybe husbands in those days didn't do what their wives asked them to do. So she went to the top, to her dad. She was given extra land with vital water supplies. And of course, having the water transform their life, transform their land and made it possible to grow and produce and eat and live. Othniel would have been away fighting a lot of the time, but he'd want feeding when he came back. One verse of a Celtic prayer that um, I, um, I like says, See the land so black and barren. God will make a watered garden. Fruitfulness where once was parchedness, light to break into the darkness, upper springs and nether springs in the field that Father's given. Hold on, will you, to the thought of that life giving water, because we'll come back to it. The Old Testament is full of references to life-giving water. We read of it springing miraculously from the rock when thirst threatened life for the people. Water, we hear, symbolizes God's presence and his power. 
power for his people. Jeremiah the prophet wailed that the people have forsaken the Lord, the spring of living water. And there are many other references to springs of living water in the prophets. Notice it's not just water. It's springs of living water. It's got life in it. But let's turn to the New Testament now. Would you with me please turn to John chapter 4? And lots of you will be thinking, we know what this is. We know what this is. John chapter 4, and we're going to start at verse 4. I don't need to give you page numbers for John. If someone sitting by you is not quite sure, then you give them a hand, please. Now, because we know this story so well, we're going to do it a little bit differently. Group of chairs up there. Think of them as representing a well. Okay. Jesus is going to sit by the well. And a woman is going to come and have a conversation with him. And we're going to read it together. As I say, because it's well known, let's read it together. Let's have somebody representing Jesus for us. Um, Jonathan, would you just come and sit up there for me with your Bible? Now, I don't want you there. I want you over here. <laughs> Where's your Bible? Okay. <laughs> you can't get the staff. You can't get the staff. Okay. Vera, would you like to come and help me out? With your Bible. Lovely. And would you come over here? And stand. I'm afraid Jonathan can sit, but you need to stand and use the mic. So we're not going to leave it to them to read this. We're going to all read it, but they're just going to be there with the mics and keep us together. So beginning at verse four, I'll do the twiddly bits in between. Now, Jesus had to go through Samaria. Oh, sorry, the men are going to be Jesus and the women are going to be the woman. I should have explained that. Oh, I think we are really now ready to go. Now, Jesus had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, men, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, a man of Samaritan. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, 
if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is, your, is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that place where we must worship in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, Woman, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in the Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do, do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in the Spirit and the truth, for they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is Spirit, and his worshippers must worship in the Spirit and in truth. Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I am the one speaking to you. I am he. And then the woman, would you like to go and stand and look at us over here to bring your mic with you? Come and talk to us. Well, you can only go so far. That's right. And she and the other women will say uh, in verse... 28, 29, come. Are we all ready for that? Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, everyone else. The men gave up a bit and left it to Jonathan, I noticed. But... Uh, he managed. Thank you, Vera. Thank you, Jonathan. It was noon. Hot, tired time of day. We remind ourselves that Jesus had a human body that got tired as ours get tired. One of the commentators said, he is in appearance a helpless, thirsty traveller. In fact, he is the Son of God who gives living water. So, Jesus introduces her to the living water. Without knowing it, she is the one that's thirsty and he is the one with the offering of water to give. It's amazing. It's amazing. A woman of doubtful reputation, though clearly not stupid, from an unacceptable background, in Jewish eyes anyway, 
has the offer of living water. The message puts it this way. An artesian spring of water, gushing fountains of endless life. I feel like saying that again. An artesian spring, gushing fountains of endless life. And she had only to ask. She had only to ask. Just as Aksar had only to ask her dad. And she got the water that made the difference between life and death. So... What is this living water I've been on about? One way of saying it is that it's the powerful, life-giving presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. A Christian still, still listening not gone to sleep yet, might say, hang on a minute. Bible tells me that if I've become a Christian, I have the Holy Spirit in my life. And it's only by his action that I became a Christian. Yes, that's true. It's true. If you're part of the Christian family, the Holy Spirit is living in you. Hallelujah. But it's also true that Jesus, then Paul and other writers, bang on, as they say, about an additional being filled with the Spirit. Being filled with the Spirit. Paul in Ephesians says, be filled with the Spirit. He also says in Galatians, keep in step with the Spirit. But when we ask him to fill us, he comes with a warning tag. He's not safe. He's not safe. Most of you have heard my testimony before that back in the 70s now, seems for some of you that's ancient history, but for me it's yesterday. Um, I was getting to the end of my tether, as it were, as a Christian. And... God filled me with his spirit for the first time. We didn't talk about the Holy Spirit at Greenford Baptist Church in those days. And I thought, yes, this is going to be a boost to my Christian life. It's going to give me new enjoyment and enthusiasm as a Christian. But in actual fact, God turned my life upside down. I was teaching, steady, secure, enjoying teaching. And I got yanked out and into college to struggle with a degree and then out to Africa, can you believe it? To teach men instead of children. Men who were going to be pastors in the church in Congo. 
He's not safe. <laughs> He's not safe. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't have missed it for anything, any of it. But he's not safe. Over here, we've got this group of chairs in a circle, and it's symbolizing for a moment a well of water. A well of water. Most wells have a spring down there somewhere that bubbles up to keep the water fresh and cool and pure. We were reminded on the Hearing from God Day of a prophecy that was given in this church some years back when we had a, a 24 hour prayer time up in the, um, was it in the, 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 in the ask room, was it? And there were sheets of paper on the walls for people to write things down that they felt God was saying to them. We ought to do that again. Um, and somebody wrote about a well of water in Greenford Baptist Church, springing up and flowing out into the community. Um, we used that. We built a well. It was a bit wobbly, wasn't it? <laughs> but it was a well made of bricks. And we used it for prophetic actions. But I don't think it's fulfilled completely. Partly it is, but not completely. It's still there, waiting to be fulfilled. Water bursting out, springing up, overflowing, and not to be controlled by us, not to be controlled by us. We can't control God. Once we say to him, uh, you do what you want to do, Lord. Lord, here I am. Lord, fill me with your spirit. Lord, take over my life. We can't then control it. We can't control it. It gets dangerous. It really does get dangerous. But without that life-giving spirit, without the filling of God's spirit in our lives, they can be <laughs> struggling, even though we struggle anyway, because we're human. And they cannot fulfill what God wants us to fulfill, to conform to what he wants in our lives. Oh, imagine, here you sit, and here I stand. If God has complete control of our lives, what wonders he can do? Here in the church and out in the community. But we can't say, well, I'm going to let God fill me with his spirit um, so I can do this and so I can do that. You might find yourself doing something very, very different 
from what you thought you would. But that's God's way. That's God's way. Do you know the story of <clears throat> the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe? Um, some of you may have read it to your children. Some of you might still read it for yourselves, as I do. It's the first story in a group of stories by C.S. Lewis, who was uh, a theologian in the last century. And he has this imaginary land of Narnia. And a group of children, four children, um, go into this land by accident, as far as they're concerned, and find it a terrible place, a frightening place, because although it's always winter, it's never Christmas. Imagine that. It's cold and snowy, and there's somebody in charge of it who's really bad, the White Witch. But there's hope. There's hope because Aslan is on the move. Aslan has been heard of. Aslan is coming. Lucy, one of the children, talking to Mr. and Mrs. Beaver in the story, says, uh, What's Aslan like? Is he a man? And Mr. Beaver says, of course he's not a man. He's the king of the wood. He is the son of the emperor over the sea. But if he's not a man, what is he? He's the king of the beasts. He's a lion. And Lucy says, is he safe? Safe, says Mr. Beaver. Safe? Of course he's not safe. He's a lion. And he's not a tame lion. Of course he's not safe. And the story goes on. If you haven't read it, do read it. The story goes on to show how with the coming of Aslan, everything is put right. The white witch is defeated. Even Christmas comes. Even Christmas. And the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, is not safe either. But who wants safety when you can have the glorious adventure of the Spirit at work in your life? I'm not talking about a once-only experience, although for many people that is very special. But I'm talking about being filled with the Spirit on a regular basis. When Paul says in Ephesians, be filled with the Spirit. It's one of those ongoing verbs that doesn't mean a one-off and that's done with. And we all have times when we forget to ask and we 
forget to receive until we're brought up short and have got low enough to realise our need. So here we are. Here we are. And if we haven't experienced God's spirit in our lives, then we're only living half a life. Sometimes the spirit comes in quietly and does his work in our lives in a quiet, almost undetectable way until we can look back and say, hey, that's changed. Ah, I used to be like that. And we haven't noticed the quiet changes he's been making. Sometimes he comes in like the roaring lion and changes things suddenly and spectacularly. As he did with me that time I was talking about. And we can't say how it's going to be. We can't say. We can't dictate. But we can ask. And God doesn't burst in. He doesn't burst in and overtake us. He waits for us to ask. Aksa asked her father, give me springs of water. And he did. The woman at the well, as we read, said, Give me this water. Give me this water. And we need to have the, the courage or the, uh, the need welling up in us to ask him. And not just to ask him once, but to ask him as part of our life. Lord, today, fill me with your spirit. Lord, lead me by your spirit. Lord, overcome for me what I can't overcome. Lord, give me this new life. But we can't tame him. And we can't dictate what he'll do. He'd probably surprise us. That woman thought she was coming on a routine visit to the well. She came in the heat of the day. The other women came earlier. Probably she wasn't acceptable to them either with her history. So she came at a time when she thought no one else would be there. But someone else was there. Someone else was there. Jesus was there. Who said, I am the fount of living water. I am the fount of living water. The water that I give, sorry, whoever drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give will never thirst. The water I give him will become in him or in her a spring of water welling up to eternal life. How did the message put it? An 
tease him well, springing up to eternal life. And we have only to ask. And it's not just for ourselves, is it? And this is the last thing I want to um, underline. It's not just for ourselves. There's a whole world out there that needs this life. Jesus said, you'll be my witnesses. Oh. It's going back up tomorrow. <laughs> Do you remember it? You will be my witnesses when, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And your witness might be in Jerusalem. It might be here. Your witness might be in Samaria, a bit further away. Or it might be to the other side of the world. We don't want to get rid of you, you understand, but uh, you never know, you never know. And Jesus was saying that you need the power of the Holy Spirit for this. You can't do it in your own strength. You don't even know where to go in your own strength. He'll lead the way. I had no thoughts of going to Africa, but I'm so glad I did. I can bore you for ages with stories of um, my time there, but I won't this morning. So there we are. And it's over to you. You all look very comfortable, but could we stand up, please? And let's pray. We only have to ask. AXA asked and received springs of water. The woman at the well said, Give me this water. Jesus says, if your child asks for a fish, will you give him a snake? Or if he asks for an egg, will he give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more Will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Lord, we are in need of you. We need you every moment of our lives. We thank you for Jesus coming to be the living water, springing up to eternal life. Lord, we ask you, fill us with your spirit. Fill us again with your spirit. Fill us to overflowing with your spirit. Fill your church with your spirit so that we may know that life that is supernatural life, spiritual life for our human life. Lord, Father, hear our prayer. In Jesus' name, Amen.
We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.